It is with the greatest pleasure now that I introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Norman Augustine. This morning, Dr. Augustine was awarded an honorary degree of Doctor of Science degree from Boston University. Dr. Augustine was raised in Colorado and attended Princeton University, earning a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering Magna Cum Laude in Aeronautical Engineering and a Master's of Science in Engineering. He joined the Douglas Aircraft Company in 1958 as a research engineer and later became chief engineer. Beginning in 65, he, out, he served in the office of the Secretary of Defense as Assistant Director of Defense Research and Engineering. He joined LTV Missiles and Space Company in 1970 as Vice President for Advanced Programs and Marketing. And in 1973, he returned to the government service as Assistant Secretary of the Army, and in 75, became Under Secretary of the Army, and later Acting Secretary of the Army. He joined Martin Marietta Corporation in 1977 as Vice President of Technical Operations and became CEO in 1987 and Chairman in 1988. He became president of Lockheed Martin under the formation of that company in 1995, retiring as chairman and CEO in 1997. Mr. Augustine served for 16 years on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology under Democratic and Republican presidents and led two major reviews of the future of the U.S. space program. And in 1990, those were done in 1990 and 2009. In 2005, he, uh, for the National Academies of Science Commission, he helped produce the landmark report, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, Energizing and Employing America for a Brighter Economic Future. And those of you who sat in open houses five years ago in April when you were a senior in high school thinking about coming here, remember that I referred to this document as the driving motivation for why we critically need to create a new kind of engineer. He has been chairman of the American Red Cross and the National Academy of Engineering, served as president of the Boy Scouts of America and on the boards of John Hopkins, MIT, and Princeton, and as a fellow of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. Mr. Augustine has received the National Medal of Technology, the Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Public Service Award, and the Department of Defense's highest civilian decoration, the Distinguished Service Medal. Please welcome Dr. Norman Augustine. Well, thank you, and thank you again for that very great honor I received earlier today. And a particular thank you for making me feel so welcome as a new member of the Boston University family. The introduction we just heard was extremely generous, and in fact, uh, it reminded me of my very first day on the faculty at Princeton. Uh, when up until that time, I had spent my entire career either in government or in industry. And I was asked to give the welcoming address to the incoming freshman engineers. Frankly, I wasn't paying much attention to what the dean was saying when he was making his opening remarks. I was flipping through my lecture notes, and all of a sudden, uh, I heard the dean say, uh, and now we will hear from Professor Augustine. And this is absolutely true. For just an instant, the thought went through my mind. Geez, what a coincidence. They've got some guy here by the same name as me. <laughs> But I should also note that uh, things are not always that good. Uh, on an occasion when I was granted an honorary degree by my alma mater, and just as the case today, I was very proud, uh, the New York Times carried an article about the event the following day. And the, the headline of the New York Times article read, uh, Muhammad Ali and three others received Princeton degree. <laughs> but I think I was the first of the three others, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> But I, I was particularly pleased uh, earlier today that the order of events was such that uh, I can't wait to go home and tell my grandchildren that I graduated first in our class. Uh, your university, uh, now our university, is truly an extraordinary place, certainly being one of the largest private institutions in America with an enormous uh, research base. And that's not to mention that you're the only institution of which I'm aware that celebrated its 100th anniversary twice, 35 years apart. <laughs> now, in thinking about remarks that might be worthy of such an auspicious occasion, uh, I asked my wife of 50 years if, uh, for advice. 
since she knows my strengths and weaknesses quite well. And after a very brief deliberation, she uh, counseled me, well, whatever you do, don't try to sound intellectual or clever or charming, just be yourself. <laughs> so I shall try to do just that. As evident as, as is evident to everyone in this room, when we entered the 21st century, we entered an altogether new world. For example, during the prior century, uh, the average American lifespan was 47 years. At the end of the century, it was 78 years. And just think of the implications of those statistics. Much of the change we've witnessed is attributable to advancements in science and engineering. In fact, I believe it's been those advancements that have made possible globalization and the global community. And I refer to two scientific and engineering developments. One was the development of the, the jet aircraft that made it possible to move objects, including people, around the world at nearly the speed of sound. And the other, of course, was the information revolution that made it possible to move ideas, knowledge, information around the world at literally the speed of light. And the result, in the world's, uh, words of Francis Cairncross, writing in The Economist, was that uh, distance is dead. And indeed, if you think about it today, distance is dead. Now, that, that's a profound statement. In fact, the uh, far-reaching Nobel laureate Arthur Compton wrote uh, some 85 years ago, the communication by printed and spoken word and television will be much more common so that the whole earth will be one great neighborhood. And the writer Tom Friedman put it in slightly different terms. He said that globalization has accidentally made Beijing, Bangalore, and Bethesda next door neighbors. Studies have shown that between 50 and 85 percent of the growth of the nation's gross domestic product is due to the work of scientists and engineers. And by my own calculation, every percent you add to the GDP creates about a million new jobs in this country. This gives some notion of the importance of the role that you can play in the future. Furthermore, it could be an enormously personally rewarding field. In my own case, I played a tiny role, and that's not modesty, it was a very tiny role, in putting 12 of my friends on the moon and getting them back alive. Uh, how good could a career be if that were the only thing that one were to do? I would have to think that would have been a great success. Fortunately, the education that each of you has received has prepared you not only to survive in this changed new world, but also to serve in this new world and, in fact, to shape it. And that's indeed a very great responsibility that you take on. Yet, if you're going to shape this world, it will require more than simply the world-class engineering education that you've received. Now, that brings me to the point where the accepted duty of a graduation speaker is to offer a few nuggets of worldly advice based upon the scar tissue that the speaker has managed to accumulate in their own career. Now, I must confess that I can't remember at my own graduation what pieces of worldly advice the speaker offered. In fact, I can't even remember who said it. Uh, the only thing I do remember is that the remarks were delivered in Latin, which for the engineers, of course, was a very great thrill. So let me move ahead, not just with one piece of advice, but actually with eight, but not to worry. As George Steinbrenner always told his new Yankee managers, I won't keep you long. <laughs> First of all, I would simply note something that you've all already learned, and that's that as important as the degree you receive today and as important as, as your health, there's something that's far more important, far more fragile, and that is your reputation. And I say this not because graduation speakers are expected to say that, and indeed they are, but I say that because I've had a number of highly accomplished friends who have somehow managed to destroy their lives because of a single slip-up in the ethical and reputational sphere. These were fundamentally decent people. They made an error in ethical judgment, and they compounded it with an attempt to 
prevent its disclosure and damage the lives of those around themselves as well as their own. And when it comes to ethics, what's been done can't be undone. There are no recalls, no do-overs, no mulligans. And among the greatest hazards, I think, uh, in this arena of ethics is the tendency to adjust one's standards under the pressure of the moment to help bring about the result that one wants to achieve. Sometimes this consists of disregarding a piece of contrary data in a research project, or maybe it's cutting short a test in an engineering uh, program. I'm reminded in this regard of the uh, Peanuts cartoon where that, that great philosopher, Charlie Brown, under the watchful eye of his peripatetic friend, Lucy, was practicing his archery. And he launched an arrow towards a fence. And as soon as the arrow stuck in the fence, he ran up to the fence, took a piece of chalk from his pocket, and drew a target around where the arrow had stuck in the fence. And he shouted out, bullseye again. Unfortunately, the world doesn't work like that, particularly the engineering world, where our judge is a very fair but very unforgiving judge, namely Mother Nature. Second, it's been my observation in most undertakings that motivation will beat mere talent almost every time. Of course, the combination of motivation and talent is nearly unbeatable. In my service on boards of four Fortune 100 companies, I've been struck at how many of the people that moved into the very top ranks were people that didn't have IQs in three digits. Rather, they were people who were intensely committed to accomplishing the work that they'd been assigned and totally dedicated themselves to that end. Thirdly, I would proffer the contrarian view that it's not useful to spend too much of your life planning the rest of your life. Be assured I subscribe to the philosophy of that other great philosopher, Yogi Berra, who warned that if you don't know where you're going, you could end up somewhere else. Uh, the problem is that there are simply too many uncontrollable variables in life to permit detailed long-range planning. And I, of course, understand that it's important to have a general sense of where you want to be and want to go. For example, if you want to be a neurosurgeon, it's probably a good idea to go to medical school. But it's also important to take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves, as they do in life. That is, it's probably easier to engage the future than it is to predict it. As a friend of mine who chaired the Lockheed Corporation some years ago, used to remind us, when opportunity knocks, try to answer the door. And turning to my fourth piece of hard-earned advice, I believe that when pursuing a career, it's important to focus upon the present responsibilities and not worry about getting ahead. The great irony is that the best way to get ahead seems to be to not try to get ahead. No one has said this better than Dr. William Osler, who is said by many to be the father of modern Western medicine. And he counseled, and I quote, I've had personal ideals, one to do to the day's work well and not to bother about tomorrow. It is to it more than anything else I owe whatever success I've had. To this power of settling down to the day's work and trying to do it well to the best of one's ability and let the future take care of itself. And that brings me to the fifth item. There, I would encourage you to engage in selfless pursuits outside of your regular responsibilities. If you do, I think you will find much greater satisfaction in life. Some years ago, a business colleague of mine, a vice president of our firm, stopped by my office to see me on the day he retired. And when he told me he wasn't sure what he was going to do with his newfound time, I suggested that he become a Red, Red Cross volunteer. Well, about three years passed before I heard from him again. Then one day in the mail, a tattered, water-stained envelope showed up. It was from my friend. His letter was written on a piece of uh, lined notebook paper in pencil, and it began, I've just spent my entire day standing in water up to my knees, handing out rolls of toilet paper. Then he said, for some reason I thought of you. But the letter continued with this, uh, concluded with the following sentence. It was one of the finest days in my life, and such days could be among the finest days in your lives as well. 
Six, I'm told that at medical school graduations, it's common for the dean to announce that, I'm sorry to inform you, but half of what we have taught you is wrong. And the problem is we don't know which half. Unfortunately, that has a lot in common, I'm afraid, with an engineering degree because things change so rapidly and there's so much new knowledge. And that means that you're going to have to continue learning throughout your life. You've only begun. And the alternative is to become professionally middle-aged within a decade. Some have even suggested that graduation certificates, diplomas, should have an expiration date printed on them. I certainly wouldn't do that. A seventh, there's a saying that life is what happens while you're making plans. And life does have a way of slipping by, take my word for it. Try not to waste life. Try to prioritize how you devote your time. Sadly, you'll find there are compromises to be made. You can't do everything, but you can do a lot. Set big goals, not little ones. Newt Gingrich once asked me if I uh, knew why lions don't hunt chipmunks. And after thinking for a moment, I said I didn't have the slightest idea. And he said, because if they catch them, they starve to death. So do set high goals. And then finally, we come to that piece of advice you've all been waiting for, the last one. And for this, I would simply observe that life is not a spectator sport. Life is not a dress rehearsal. And the greatest regrets in life are not the opportunities one pursued and failed, but the ones that one failed to pursue. Everyone is periodically confronted with decisions as to whether to remain in one's comfort zone, preserve the status quo, or in the words of Robert Frost, to take the road less traveled. This, of course, entails taking certain risks, considered risks, not injudicious or frivolous risks, but carefully considered judgmental risks. An incident I once observed in this regard would perhaps best make my point. Some years ago, I was participating in a course with my wife. One of the speakers uh, was seeking to make the point that I just made. And to do so, he postulated to the audience uh, that there was a large I-beam laying on the floor across in front of the podium. And he got a volunteer from the audience to stand up, and he asked this volunteer, he said, if I were to give you $20 to walk across that I-beam here on the floor, would you do it? And the fellow in the audience said he, he certainly would. Uh, the speaker then said, supposing I took that same I-beam and put it between two 40-story buildings over a highway, same I-beam, but way up over the 40-story buildings, and I will give you the same $20 to walk across it. Would you do it? And the fellow in the audience said, no way. Well, the speaker should have quit, but he didn't. He went on and said, uh, now, supposing the same I-beams above those two 40-story buildings, and I have one of your children, I'm holding them out over the edge of the, one of the buildings, and you're on the other building, and I say to you, if you don't walk across that I-beam, I'm going to drop your kid. Now, what would you do? And without hesitation, the fellow in the audience said, which kid do you have? <laughs> well, today it's obvious to the parents, the grandparents, the families, the friends that we have great kids, and some of them very adult kids here today, that have done great things and will do great things in their life. I'm proud to be a part of your class. I congratulate you, and I wish you Godspeed.